Joining us now is Rebecca Versbrock. Uh, Rebecca is a very well known and very well respected object practitioner and designer. Rebecca is the inventor of responsibility driven design and the author of a number of books that have become classic. And Rebecca is one of the people who is responsible for the way object oriented designers think these days. Welcome to the program, Rebecca, and it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. So I was thinking of asking you uh, when you discovered domain-driven design, but then I realized that you used it way before it became known as domain-driven design. So tell me about your history with it. With it. Uh, well, basically, a lot of the concepts of responsibility-driven design are uh, cousins, if not predecessors to domain-driven design. I think that the focus on uh, what is the domain model and how do you talk about it, uh, there's some new things in domain-driven design. But certainly a lot of the, uh, I say, basic principles of thinking about well-formed concepts with relationships, naming things uh, that are there, and modeling what is part of the language has certainly been part of my culture, just, just the way you think about it. Um, and I've never been one of those fans that says, oh, object modeling is modeling the real world. No, it's creating a model that's what we need to do. So there's a lot of similar values, if you will. Now, domain-driven design introduces many new things, that, but I think they all build on my values. So. <laughs> yeah. So when you teach responsibility-driven design, do you um, integrate concepts of domain-driven design in it? Uh, actually, I do. And uh, it's, it's interesting, the progression of what I talk about. I talk about uh, you know, why object, objects, why are, they, why are they good, and some of the principles of abstraction and uh, encapsulation and flexibility. When we talk about roles and responsibilities, uh, we talk about certain kinds of objects, in, in, say, perhaps in the architecture. And so you talk about a domain model that may exist in the applications. And then so you can introduce them into uh, the concepts that I talk about uh, of, of various different stereotypical roles. So one of the roles that, that I have is a information holder, and another one is a structuring role. And so that's a natural lead-in to talk about aggregates that are domain concepts, aggregate roots, and their responsibilities. An aggregate root is a kind of structure that represents the domain. And, and you can also talk about the distinction, because actually this is important for people to know between entity versus value objects. And so it's just, you just kind of slide these things in. And it seems to fit seamlessly the way I talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so then there is yet another side of domain-driven design, namely integration of domain-driven design with uh, technical frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what do you say about that, like things like Hibernate or persistence frameworks? It's, it's kind of interesting in that uh, if you look at the domain-driven design uh, in the book, the patterns they talk about, having a repository, uh, having queries and rules and things like that, that are, um, you know, a repository being a, a concept of my invention as a domain-driven uh, uh, developer following those practices, that essentially hides um, the fact that something might be persistent or not, and then I query against it. Nice if it works in theory, right? But if it doesn't perform well, gee, what do I do? Or can <laughs> I use can I use some uh, built-in frameworks that do this stuff for me? They do all their mechanisms. How do those two mesh together? Uh, actually, um, they can mesh together, but it is there is a tension between um, do I have this pure way of thinking about domain-driven design that's somewhat naive, or can I make it accommodate working with those frameworks? Um, as a matter of fact, I was uh, reviewing a, a, a design this past year, and uh, one of the issues that we did talk through is, should I let all this hibernate wonderful mechanisms 
uh, play out for managing my objects or should I use the domain-driven design repositories because we're doing domain-driven design. That was the, their particular. And so we, we managed to find a way to have value of the repositories and using save uh, rather than having this, this uh, hibernate uh, automagic behind your, you know, magically if you set it up because it really did add value and clarity to what, you know, what a transaction was uh, in there. But they, they had to come to figure this out. It wasn't an easy kind of choice. So it, I don't know that I believe that repositories are an essential aspect of domain-driven design so much as the domain model and the way you think about it and shape it. And that, uh, however, there was some benefit and we came, it came down <laughs> on that side. Um, the thing that um, is interesting to think about when you think of all the patterns in that book is a number of them are for how do I think about the domain model and how do I come up with creating and nurturing it and preserving the, the language fit to the programming constructs I create. And then there's all these other, I'm going to say, mechanisms for uh, dealing with the uglies that exist, like shoring <laughs> up boundaries and uh, um, handling um, translation and, and mismatches between this model and, and the rest of the world. And then how do I fit that into a persistence mechanism without getting that tangled up? And those are all good ideas. But the core really is that domain modeling stuff. I mean, that, the, creating the model and how do I go about thinking about that. The other day, you were giving a tutorial, the art of telling your design story. Uh, Domain-driven designers, just like any other designers, are doing that, telling their stories on a daily basis. This is what we do. So other than attending your tutorial, which is not necessarily possible for everybody. Um, what would be your word of advice to us? And how do I explain the modeling that I'm coming up? One of the things about domain-driven right. design um, is that we don't do big upfront design of the domain and then just implement it. Right. So we're having to tell stories about why we need to uh, make a change, right? We learn a new language, then, then our model uh, may have to shift and readjust, okay? So one of the things from storytelling that I talked about was the fact of giving uh, sound reasons why you thought one thing and then maybe this option is now better. And so the way you do that, you have to be very concrete with the kind of stories you tell. You have to run through a scenario and show perhaps why this fails, and then show the new one and compare the two and say, well, see, given that we now have structured it this way. So, so the evolving, uh, I need to see concrete examples run through that rather mm -hmm. than just look at, uh, you know, I'm going to say, brutal, only the brutal code that's done the difference or, or I just believe it's right. You know, you need to show the examples. And, and one of the things that I also talked about in the art of telling your story is to know what to emphasize and how to increase something's emphasis. So if I'm looking at a domain model, um, and we can do that visually by laying out classes and whatever, but we need to be worried about um, putting what I call wallpaper, you know, where we're showing all the implementation details and then the essence of the domain that I'm talking about right now may get lost. Uh, so one of the bits of advice that I have is, uh, although those tools that, that, you know, modeling tools that allow you to pull out and see the classes, mm. if you will, and the relationships, I know the Eclipse plugins, when I'm looking at an implementation view, that oftentimes is too much uh, stuff. stuff. And so taking and snipping it out and drawing it in some other tool that allows you just to capture the essence of the thread of those operations that you know are, are on those objects that are interrelating and how I'm, how I'm dealing with it in this scenario is a much better way to, to talk about it. As we build up a domain model, it becomes more complex. And one of the things about domain-driven design is it's not done in a vacuum, it's done with coding and implementation right there. 
Um, but you do need to pull back and have a view on certain episodic uh, threads through it to understand the domain model. And so I actually like sketching out uh, bits and fragments to talk about it because they don't need to see all the detail <laughs> all at once. And uh, that sort of, when I say this, the tutorial that I gave was called The Art of Telling Your Story, it's knowing what to leave out as well as include. It's not just what do I show, but also what do I, what do I leave out? Um, UML allows you to have the little dot, 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 or ellipse, you know, when you're drawing a class diagram anywhere, like in operations or other classes here that are in an inheritance hierarchy. Um, so you can legally, there's a way of annotating it even that like, conforms to UML, UML if that mattered to you. But that art of arranging things so that the focus is on what we're talking about is, is important. And I also like using color and various things to emphasize threads of, of, of interest, interesting things that I'm telling about in my story. Now, I can't give you any recipes for that, but if certain things are related, you know, uh, so, so I use, uh, you know, expressing models as sort of a, uh, a challenge to how visually can I, can I make things important and de-emphasize the noise. Because oftentimes there's just too much stuff if you included everything. Let's abandon the domain driven design topic for now and just zoom out to the okay. software and design in general and software in general. What do you think was the most important event in the last maybe 20 years in software? Last 20 years, probably for me, uh, it was programming in a, in a programming environment that allowed me to build things um, incrementally and see them and observe them while they were running. And I am referring to the small talk uh, development environment. When I was at Tektronix, I, before I got involved in small talk, um, and it's a little more than 20 years, but 21 years was when we first came out with the pro some of the products that I was involved in. Before that, I was uh, programming an assembly language. So it was very hard to uh, step through and so when I got exposed to the small talk environment where I could interact with my software as I was building my software, that was just a, I think that has a profound impact on your ability to understand and explore your software as you're building it. Rather than going through this, oh I have to figure it out <laughs> and then I have to translate it to something. And, and, and that's actually kind of interesting because the Domain driven design is all about having that conversation, ongoing conversation, and making sure that uh, your code expresses the domain as you understand it. So it's just a continuation of that sort of ongoing interaction. Although uh, it requires the designer to be conscious of it, you know, to, to really exploit that. And so it's a set of values that you have to bring into, you know, OO technology to use domain driven design. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you.